kind of special meetings that we were doing. And so I'm going to pick up this morning with part two of the own unknown God entitled, Cast Down Our Idols. Cast Down Our Idols. So if you have your Bibles, let's go to Acts chapter 17. And I'm going to begin in verse 16. <clears throat> I think I gave you guys a, a slightly different for Acts. Oh, uh, children, if you have not got up to leave yet. <laughs> please forgive me. That's going to take a while. When, when we traveled a lot into different churches, my kids just sat with us. You know, other kids went to children's church, but mine stayed in the sanctuary with us and and uh, uh, we have a really good children's program, and so uh, it's not that I don't want your kids to go because I don't think it's very good. It's I don't think about that because I don't have little ones running around. But um, <clears throat> if you want to keep your children in here, I'm okay with that too. They, that does not bother me at all. As a matter of fact, babies crying, children screaming, that means there's life in the church. <laughs> Amen. I mean, if you're only in a church and you hear grunting and groaning and snoring, there's no life in that church. <laughs> if there's a lot of grunting, groaning, and snoring, then uh, um, we're a little older than what we'd like to, to be, okay? So, screaming, crying, running around, I'm good with that. Snotty noses, mm-mm, love it. All right, <laughs> let's go to Acts chapter 17. We're going to begin in verse 16. <clears throat> I know Becky's going... They'll just throw something at me. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at, at Athens, waiting for the other disciples, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. Verse 22. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, or the agnostos theos. What therefore you worship is unknown. This I proclaim to you, that God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. And even some of your own poets have said, For we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and the imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked. But now... He commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man he whom, he has whom he has appointed and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed and among whom also were Dionysius the Arapaga, and a woman named Demarius, Damaris, and others with him. So today we're going to focus <clears throat> primarily on verses 24, 25, and 29. So let's go back and, and just revisit those real quick. 24 and 25 and verse 29. So 24 and 25, 
We see the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives all to mankind life and breath and everything. And just move down to verse 29 and it says, Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. So that's going to be the context from where we're going to, to talk this morning. So I believe that we all have a sense or an idea or a feeling of what idolatry is, right? <clears throat> what, what would we say idolatry is? What does it mean? I know it's not Wednesday, but you can interact. <laughs> you love something more, more than you love God. That's in the context of us, but what, what would we say idolatry is in a non-Christian context? There you go. So, so really, we, we put it in the context as Christians because we understand, you know, contextually that when we, when we love something more than God or we put something in front of God, then that's idol worship. But in reality, that context goes even deeper. Something that we love more than anything else, that is idol worship. That's, that's really the, the premise behind idolatry because the Jews understood idolatry. They saw it in the pagans all around them. So idolatry wasn't, I mean, when you look at someone that's worshiping something and they have no concept of God, who Father is, who Yahweh, Jehovah is, that's still idolatry. So we, we just try to move it into the context as, as a believer and a Christian, but they are worshiping an object and putting whatever you know, value in that object that is greater than anything else in their life. And then, like the, the Athenians or the Grecians, they would have objects of varying hierarchy. And certain objects would be of greater value or greater worth or greater power than other objects. And then some objects would be very compartmentalized into a specific thing, you know, the sun, the moon, the water, the fish, the harvest, whatever. Throughout humanity, that has not changed. Even the native Indians of our own land and our own culture had a diversity of gods and, and idols that they worshipped. They believed that 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 the crops were the result of a particular God. The rains were as a result of a particular God. Even some of the more ancient cultures, as you start to go farther south uh, in North America, they believed that when the crops would fail because there, weren't no, there wasn't any rain, that, that multiple gods would be angry. The rain God, the sun God, the crop God will all be angry. And who are they angry at? They're angry at humans. So they even understood that there could be a depravity at, at, at risk here, that maybe they're not doing the things that they should do, and so they had to purify the process. And that's how, you know, uh, um, sacrificing of innocent or sacrificing of children or sacrificing of, of virgins. And you, just to, for, for context here, you know, male virgins were sacrificed as much as female virgins, okay? So a lot of times we think and we look throughout history that it's only the female virgins, and no, it's not. Male virgins were also, because male, the masculinity, was also the, 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 the vision of strength and of power, okay? And so sometimes they would sacrifice men just as much as they would women, depending on what they wanted to please their God in. You see that? And so that's something that humanity has always done. Exodus 20, verse 3 through 6 God is very specific as he's talking to the children of Israel. And this particular commandment, even Jesus brings very current when he says the first commandment, the one that is the most important, is, having, is loving God. And so we look at this, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations." 
of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to the thousands of those who love me and keep my commands. This is, this is a subcontext of the, the, the commandment that says that you shall love the Lord your God with all your might, your heart, and your strength. There shall be no other gods other than him. And Jesus said that the first commandment that he brings is not a new commandment, but it's really one that you know, that you will love the Lord your God with all your might, your heart, and your strength. And if, if really, we can leave it right there. We don't have to add the subcontext that don't build idols or don't make this, because that should be enough. And in the context of the Hebrew or the Ar- Aramaic language, that was enough. But, you know, us humans, sometimes we're a little thick-headed. So, so God sometimes has to break it down a little bit more in minutia and in a little more detail to say, okay, guys, this means you can't worship that pulpit, okay? You can't worship this. You can't worship that because I am enough. I am more than enough. Amen? Amen. Yes, <clears throat> And so we talked last time, several weeks ago, concerning the Greek and the Roman gods that Paul confronted when he, he was speaking to them on Mars Hill. Mars Hill, Aeropagus, same thing, okay? Mars is, 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 is the Roman version of the Greek god Ares, okay? The god of, of, of war. So when you hear Mars Hill and you hear Aeropagus or the, the, the mountain of Ares, it's the same person and same place. Although the Gentile nations were steeped in idolatry, God's chosen people, the Hebrews, were not exempt in their failings in worship of the things that were created by hands and out of the imagination of the mind and heart. I have a lot of scripture today, but there are even more, there are hundreds of scripture out there that talk about where the the Hebrew children would go through this cycle where they would have a righteous king or a righteous leader, a righteous ruler. When that righteous king and righteous ruler would die, his predecessor would come in and would be a wicked and evil ruler. The people would turn their hearts away from God, turn their hearts away from the, the the authority that was in the man that was representing God's authority, and he would even, this man would even, you know, be a catalyst for this. He would be the first one to sacrifice. He would be the first one to worship. Um, The king would make alliances with other countries and cultures that would actually infiltrate the Jewish nation or the, the Hebrew nation. See, the kings that came after Abraham didn't have the same mindset that Abraham. Abraham's mindset was this. It's like, yes, you can, you can marry our daughters. You can come alongside of us and, and, and work our fields and work our cattle, but only under one condition. You must become like us. You must forsake all your gods. You must forsake all your practices, all your worship, all your idolatry. You must forsake those things. Be circumcised into blood covenant with Yahweh, with Jehovah. And only then, and only then, can you come alongside of us and be with us. But the kings that came after, because the children of Israel wanted a king, because everybody else had kings, they would also fall, fall prey and fall into the exact same things that other kingdoms and nations and cultures fell into. Okay? So they, they, were, they were not absolved of this. In Exodus 33, 2 through 4, so Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters. You notice sons were wearing rings? Okay, just want to make sure. <laughs> sons wore jewelry. Okay. Take off the rings and the gold that are in the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters. Okay, earrings. And bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. Again, earrings. Um, And he received the gold from their hand. And What? Why do you guys keep laughing? I'm just reading scripture. Okay. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, you, who you brought up out of the land of Egypt. So in context, Moses is up on the mountain, ironically, receiving the Ten Commandments from God. <laughs> He's receiving the very law that says that you will love the Lord your God with all your might, heart, and strength. You will have no other gods before me. You will not create any graven images and blah, 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 blah. But because he was up there for so long, they're like, 
this Moses fellow, we don't know where he's at. We don't know what to make of him. And he's the only thing that we know. So that tells me that they were probably worshiping Moses to a certain point, correct? That they were worshiping Moses, not him as the man, but because he was the conduit. He was the, he, he was the representation of God. And so as long as Moses was before them, then they had a, a sense of confidence that God was still there, that his presence was still among them. But when Moses was gone and all they hear are rumblings and, and stuff going on in the mountain, lightning and clouds, you know, I guess if I'm down on the ground, I'm going, man, God's pretty ticked off at Moses. You know, he's, get, he, he's getting the tar whooped out of him. God's going a full MMA on Moses up there on that mountain. What are we to think of him? You know, he's never going to return. He's just going to be a little white spot when he gets back, you know? So no, they go and say, we need something to worship. We have to put our eyes on something. And Aaron, he submits to that, and he creates it for them. And then he goes through this whole kind of ordination process and puts this, these gods before them and said, Behold, this is Aaron, the high priest, the brother of Moses, the one who was consecrated and purified to be the priest of the priest for the tribe of Levi. And he comes and he ordains before the people at the base of the same mountain that God is presenting the Ten Commandments to Moses. He presents these idols that are now their gods that they will worship. Talking about a slap, <laughs> you know? So have we considered really idol worship? If you think about this, it's really foolish. <clears throat> that we create, we create, out of our own imagination, something with our own hands, to worship, adore, trust, <laughs> sacrifice to, even expect to intervene on our behalf, yet it has no animation whatsoever. That's no different than this chair. Give me my chair. That's the chair God. So Trinity, we're going to start worshiping this chair God. <laughs> That's a joke, okay? <laughs> I know, but you know what's sad is nobody got up to leave. But this, this is exactly, this has the exact same components of any idol. But because it's not fashioned into some type of, of persona or character that we've imagined, we would never go, that's a chair, James, seriously. It's not a God. But no, it still possesses the exact same components. It also possesses the exact same ability that any other idol or God that we can create, it has the exact same ability. It's not going to do anything on its own. Unless I pick it up and throw it back there at Lionel, it's not going to move. Right? It can't dance unless I control it. So I'm controlling my God. I'm controlling my idol. I'm making it do what I want it to do. Look, my idol can dance. You know? I could, <laughs> I could do whatever I want. Do you see, that's the whole concept of idolatry. It's not really that we want to worship something that we have no control over. We want to worship something that we can manipulate. We want to worship something that we have control over. I can make this do what I want, and I can say, look what my God told me, Shirley. But you know what's ironic about a chair? Like I said, it has the exact same materials as, as anything else that we can create. But I'm going to put the most vile part of my body on my object of worship. Why would I do such a thing? If this is my object of worship, why would I do such a thing? Why isn't it striking me down right now? Come on, chair. Because it can't do anything. Idols have no power. It, it has no animation except for what I give it. See, that's, that's the difference between our God. There is no other God, 
known to man that is animated like our God. Animation just means that it has life. It's not a puppet, but it has its own life. It has its own breath. It has its own will. It has its own desire. We know God cries because it says that Jesus wept. So, we know, so our God has feelings. Our God has emotions. Now can our God have emotions? It says that we are created in his likeness and image. Did you ever understand why there's two distinct? Not that we're just created in his image. The image means we look like God. The likeness means we act like God. We have every attribute and character of his nature in us. There is nothing in us that isn't in God. Did you ever think about that? <laughs> He's alive. He's not dead. He, I mean, you know what's even better? What's better than saying that our God is alive is to say that our God lives. Yes. Alive just seems so, uh, okay, he's alive. But no, he lives. Lives is a very active verb. means that there are things still going on in Jesus' life. How are they going on? They're going on in us. If all Jesus is is alive, then, then he has just become what? Another type of idol. We might as well slap a cross on the wall, say, that's my Jesus, and he's alive. And then what we've done is we've taken all of the power, we've taken all of the authority, we've taken all of his sovereignty, and we've empowered this cross. As long as I got my cross, everything's cool, right? No? But see how foolish we are at times when we try to put something before God. Something that we're going to sacrifice to. Listen, it sits silent. It's stone cold. It's unmovable. But yet we expect it to bless, it deliver, heal, show favor, or act on our behalf. How can something so lifeless be expected to improve our life? when lifelessness equates to death. <laughs> so we create an image out of our own imagination. We empower that image, and we expect that image to have life. But the image is something that God created that in order for us to use it as a raw material, it has to die. And once it's dead, we can tack it up, we can fashion it, we can do whatever we want, but now, guess what? It never comes back to life. It still continues to stay dead. There is no idol that lives, ever. Any type of idolatry in our life, if it has any type of influence or, or, or life of its own, it's what we've empowered it to have and, and it's what we do to animate it. Go to Isaiah chapter 46. Verse 5 through 7. <clears throat> to whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we may be alike? Those who lavish gold from the purse and weigh out silver in the scales, they hire a goldsmith, and he makes it into a god. Then they fall down and worship. Verse 7, they lift it to their shoulders and they carry it. They set it in its high place and it stands there. It cannot move from its place. If one carry cries to it, it does not answer or save him from his trouble. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 10. Beginning in verse 1. Jeremiah 10, verse 1. 
Hear the word that the Lord speaks to you, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, learn not the way of the nations, nor be dismayed at the signs of the heavens, because the nations are dismayed at them. For the customs of the peoples are vanity. A tree from the forest is cut down and worked with an axe by the hands of a craftsman. They decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with hammer and nails so that it cannot move. Their idols are like scarecrows in a cucumber field, and they cannot speak. They have to be carried, for they cannot walk. Do not be afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither it is in them to do good. There is none like you, O Lord. You are great, and your name is great in might. Who would not fear you, O King of the nations? For this is your due, for among all the wise ones of the nations, and in all their kingdoms, there is none like you. They are both stupid and foolish, and the instruction of idols is nothing but wood. <laughs> Beaten silver is brought from Tarshish, and gold from Uphaz. They are the work of the craftsmen and of the hands of the goldsmith. Their clothing is violet and purple. They are all the work of skilled men. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. At His wrath the earth quakes and the nations cannot endure His indignation. Now you, you hear me talk a lot about how we are not under the law. We are not bound by the law. The, the feast and, and, and all of the sacrifices and everything that goes with the, the, the Mosaic law. So if you're asking, why am I in the Old Testament? If you're not, here's why I'm in the Old Testament. Anyway, <laughs> remember I said, I focus on the two commandments that Jesus restates to us in the New Testament because that is our, that is our new commandment. That's the commandment that he has established for his church. And he makes association with the first one to the first commandment he gave to Moses. So that commandment and everything contextually assigned to the first commandment of the Mosaic law is still contextually assigned to us. Y'all understand that, right? So, so to say, well, I'm not under the law. True, you're not under all of the letter of the law, but Jesus made it clear that we are under the very first commandment, which he said, it's not really a new commandment. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength. So contextually, I normally don't go back to the Old Testament if it's something that doesn't apply to us because most of us are Gentiles. We're not Jews. We weren't brought up Jew. We, we weren't brought up into the traditions and, and things. If, if you ever, if anyone has been, then we would have a different conversation for them and how they would. So if this was a Messianic Jew church, my language would be completely different. Everything that we would talk about would tie back to the Mosaic Law. Because that's the only thing they know. And all of that has to be brought forward into Christ. But we weren't, so we only focus on the things that Christ brought forward. Does that make sense? Okay. So, the official establishment of Christianity by Constantine. Does anybody know the history behind the Christian church? Okay, we the, the, there was a pope, right? So, the pope became the the religious leader of the early Christian church. There's a lot of history to get to that particular point. Whether it, you agree with it or disagree with it, the bottom line is the Christian evolution, as we know it, the churches did evolve to this pope leadership. Okay? Rome became separated so the Roman Empire became separated, and it had two fa fa factions. They had an east faction and a west faction. The western faction, was, was, uh, its capital was in Rome, and it was run by the emperor and the pope. They were the two ruling entities of the, that part of the Roman Empire. The eastern part of the Roman Empire was established in Constantinople, which is now Istanbul. Okay? Constantine, which, con in, uh, which, thank you, <laughs> was named after, was the emperor of the eastern part of the kingdom. Constantine, whether he had a true transformation experience or not, he recognized that Christians were a force to be reckoned with. 
He recognized that you can beat them. You can, you can skin them. You, you can poke their eyes out. You can tar. You can feather them. You can kill them. But somebody's going to raise them from the dead. It's, you can do anything you want. You can boil them. You can put them at the stake. Nero, Nero would take Christians, dip them in kerosene, shove a spear through their bodies from the bottom, and imp true impalement all the way up through the top, light them on fire, and that's how he lit the Roman road. Did y'all know that? <laughs> the Roman road, like street lamps, was illuminated by the bodies of Christians. Constantine's like, you can kill these guys and they don't budge. They don't give in. They don't deny. They won't bow down and worship an emperor. This Jesus is more powerful. He's more influential than even the emperor. Yes. <laughs> so he's, he's like, something's got to give. So I, I don't know if he had a true conversion, but he established Christianity, Christianity as the official nation religion. Christians were no longer being martyred, at least in the eastern part of the kingdom. They began to live in freedom. So Constantine paved the way for idolatry in the early church. Prior to this instant, the early church had no buildings. They had no stone. They had no brick or mortar. They met in houses. They met in secret. They traveled from place to place. They had symbols and signs that how they would know if they were at the right place. Y'all know the story? The isthmus, the fish? There'd be one part of it, and if you were, if you, were you know, friendly, you'd finish it. And there's a whole, whole bunch of other ways that they would communicate. But they did not have an established building like we have now. When Constantine made it the official religion, it was at that moment that paganism and idolatry began to infiltrate the church. To the point that you cannot go to a church in, in Europe or in, in that part of the, of, the, of the world and not see religious symbols. Now, we're not as fanatical as, as the Muslims that say you can't draw a picture of Muhammad, their prophet, right? If you draw a picture of, of Jesus, nobody's going to come stone you or cut your head off or anything like that. But nevertheless, <clears throat> if we look at these pictures, these pictures were always painted in such a fashion that gave them more illumination than what they were. There is only one who should receive illumination. And that's Christ. But if you look throughout all the paintings and all the, the statues and everything that they created, the, the, the stained glass, the, everybody that was affiliated and associated had a very similar persona that was painted or, or put into an image. So the, Christ, the early Christian church, with the encouragement of pictures and images in their religious services, that's how idolatry began to come back into the church. Now, I've said this before. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with having a cross. There's not anything wrong with having a picture of Jesus. There's not anything wrong. None of that stuff is wrong. It's very, it's harmless. And, and, and it has some value for us to fix our eyes on something that we believe. But in that same context, when we fix our eyes, are we fixing our eyes on the picture? Or are we fixing our eyes on the picture that's in our heart. I guarantee if you go into some very traditional churches, and because uh, I know you're not as wound up and radical as me, and you walked right up to the main sanctuary or foyer, grabbed that picture of Jesus with the lamb, took it out to the parking lot, and destroyed it, the entire church would come after you in a mob. Because <clears throat> I just killed Jesus. No, Jesus is alive! <laughs> I just destroyed wood, glue, brick, mortar. I didn't destroy Jesus. But you see, the principle, we, we create these things, and yes, they, they may have a purity of heart, 
But in reality, if you went and destroyed them, you would see people's true heart towards that image. Oh, I've seen it with pews and parking spaces. By the way, somebody parked in my spot this morning. I was told that that was my spot, and whether I park in there or not, that's my spot. Whose Cadillac is that? <laughs> I pull in, I go, whose Cadillac is in my spot? And Becky goes, ooh, I think that's Anna's. <laughs> but hang down, it's okay, Barbara. Calm down. <laughs> Barbara's like, what'd he say? Let me go back there. <laughs> I was using it as, as a point of reference, okay? I could care less about the parking spot, okay? But the whole, the, that's the whole point. If it had been somebody else, and I'm not talking about anybody previous, I'm just saying in other churches. We, we actually visited a church this weekend, and right there in front, man, there was a big old sign that said, Pastor's Parking. <laughs> Nobody in the congregation put that there. Only one person could put that there. The pastor's wife. <laughs> ah, just kidding. <laughs> But churches, churches have split over idolatry. You can't take the pews out of the church. Why not? It's wood. They're rotten. They stink. They've had nasty bottoms for the last 50 years sitting in them. Who wants to turn around and pray? Oh, Lord Jesus. Come on, now we live in Beeville. Lots of beans and tacos. You don't want to turn around and pay, play, pray in a pew that's 40 years old. <laughs> but that pew was bought by sister so-and-so 100 years ago, and it has her brass plaque on it, which... Yeah, see, sister so-and-so. Come on. We, we, we say we, that we are not an idolatrous, idolatrous people, but do you know the church is the most idolatrous? Yes. We raise up these principles. We raise up these things, and oh my God, you can't speak against them. You can't talk against them. You won't get that out of me. I, 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 mean, I'm, I, I told someone one time before, I said, you know what? I've never lost a job because I've done something wrong. Never. In all of my life and career, I've never been fired because I messed up. But I have been let go because I was right. I have been let go because I was speaking the truth. I have been let go because I've challenged the institution and the organization. That's okay. So the only way that I'm leaving here is y'all are going to run me out of town because you didn't like the truth. <laughs> Look, even in the, in the 8th century during the Second Council of Nicaea decreed, this is what was decreed. Y'all know the Nicene Creed? Okay. In this same council, the 8th council, is that if you know the Apostles' Creed, that this came out of, okay? The council decreed this, that the image of God was a proper object of worship as if it were God himself. I guess you won't be uh, reciting the Apostles' Creed anymore, huh? <laughs> that the very image of God had the same power persona as if it were God himself. That's how this stuff gets created. I remember one time I was preaching, I grabbed my Bible, and I said, this is just paper. This is mulch. It's, it's not even real leather. It's bonded leather. And I slung it across the room. It hit the wall and exploded. You just destroyed God's holy word. No, it says that his word is where? In my heart. 
on my lips. I didn't throw my heart and my lips against the wall. His word is written here. Oh, you, you, people, when you pull out your tablet, they're going, where's your Bible? Right here. You know, I'm not reading Beetle Bailey when I'm up here preaching. <laughs> this isn't Garfield Picks. You see Garfield Picks? Hey, stop it. <laughs> He's going to go pull up his account and see where he sent me a meme. Yeah, see right there? <laughs> He's the meme master. <laughs> but that, I mean, listen, I love the word of God and no, we, we, should be, we should be mindful of the content that's in it, but we shouldn't get so wrapped up in the fact that, you know, that's not what drives us. That's not our motivator. Jesus told him when he sent them out by twos in Matthew 10 and Luke 10, he said, don't take any script with you. Don't take any written scripture. Because in the appointed time, in the appointed moment, my Father will give you what to say. The Word of God is not in the Scripture that's written by a man. The Word of God is in the prophetic Word, the prophetic message that is written in our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is our reference point. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. I get the Word into me by reading it. But it is only logos. It is the written word. That's all it is. Until it gets into my soul, my suke, my intellect, my thinking, my emotions, and then gets transferred and translated by the Holy Spirit into my heart, then it gets transformed into rhema. The living prophetic word of God. That resides here and no one can take that away. Take every Bible away. Destroy it, burn it, I don't care. I have it here. If, if the United States decided to go on a Bible book burning, fine with me. You can't take it away. <laughs> I'm still going to tell people about Jesus. I, I am convinced that if there were not a single written Bible that ever existed on the planet again, we would not go without God's Word. The Holy Spirit will be even more intentional to bring that to our remembrance. Scriptures that you never thought that you remembered. Chapter, verse, when, even context, the Holy Spirit's going to say, no, you need this for now. You tell them about this. But I don't have my Bible. You don't need the Bible. You got me, buddy. That the very image of God is just like God. You see, today in churches and all across our, the old country, from its humble to its elaborate edifices and facades, they're emblazoned with graven images of angels and the apostles and disciples, martyrs, and even the family of Jesus immortalized in a colorful array. The cross has even become an object of worship. We know this because it has been sanitized, beautified, and uniquely redesigned in a myriad of expressions around the globe. We probably have 20 different versions and expressions of crosses in our home. Okay, you're going, wait a second, you just talked about not having crosses on the wall, but you have them on your home. They're pretty. They decorate our, our house. They, it does remind us of who we are as a family. And when people walk into our house, they see that, and they see that, oh, this must be a Christian home. But I guarantee we don't sit there and worship those crosses. If, if I took those crosses down tomorrow and I threw them in the trash, she's not going to yell at me because, oh my God, I threw the cross away. She's going to say, what are you going to replace up there because that wall looks empty? <laughs> you, you see what I mean? The, the cross on our, on, our, on our living room wall doesn't define who we are as believers. We define who we are as believers by the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, if anything, I should take the, that 52-inch box that's sitting in front of my TV right in the middle of the room that pictures come in all the time. That's probably more of an idol. If she got rid of my flat-screen TV, I would probably be pretty ticked off. <laughs> After I got over myself, then I go, ooh, what would Becky say? Hey, so you're buying me a bigger TV? <laughs> <laughs> Look... <clears throat> Have you ever noticed that the more beautiful the cross, the more in awe we become? 
The cross was an ugly, ugly thing. It's a symbol of death. But yet we admire a beautiful cross and we forsake the rugged cross. We buy them based upon how they will adorn and decorate and accessorize our outfits, our homes, and our churches. And Christ is rarely the central motivation, but an afterthought or a byproduct benefit of being a Christian. Sometimes a cross is more like a rabbit's foot. Just like some scriptures that are cast out there. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. As long as I recite that a hundred times, I'm going to be fine, right? God's going to come in, right? Or I can recite a thousand times, I'm, I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above only and not beneath. I'm blessed coming in and blessed going out. So if I have that written on my bathroom mirror, right? If I have it every time I open my, my Bible, if I see it on the dash of, of, my, of my car, as long as I recite it a thousand times, that's what's going to happen, right? I can recite all those prosperity and faith scriptures until I'm blue in the face. But if there's no corresponding action to go with them, it doesn't matter how many times I say them. I can wear my cross every day. People that wear crosses still get attacked. They still get assaulted. They still get killed. <laughs> Anymore, I think you're probably more likely to get shot or, or attacked if you have a cross. Oh, suffering for Jesus. You don't even know Jesus. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. And we're actually probably going to wind this down, and I'll pick up next week. This will be a two-parter. Romans 1, beginning in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creepy things. And I'm going to stop there, guys, and I'll pick up the rest of that next week. Look, it is not by accident that we have the amazing joy and pleasure to look at the trees, to hear the birds, to smell fresh air. To look at mountain ranges and just be in absolute awe. If if we don't ever look at God's creation and it doesn't mesmerize us and, and captivate us, there's something really wrong with us. No, we don't worship the, 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 the stars. We don't worship the sun. We don't worship the mountains. We don't worship the trees or the flowers or the birds. We don't worship those things. But there's nothing wrong with having just a deep appreciation and admiration that God created all of those things. I, I, I get, I am still amazed and in awe at the reproduction of life and the cycle of life. Whether it's in a plant, whether it's an animal, or whether it's a human. God, you are awesome. How did you make these separate parts that when they're connected under the right circumstances and the right instances, that you create new life out of it? Do you know, even even the most destructive force on the planet, it's horrible when we have to go through it. But it's inevitable that the result of that destruction creates new life. A forest fire that destroys a million acres of forest is devastating. It hurts. 
It's painful. If, you, if, you, if, you've, if you've ever been to Bastrop before the fires, it's gorgeous to walk through the pine. It's gorgeous. There, there's a trail that goes from the north side of the lake to the south side of the lake. It takes a couple hours to do the whole thing. And man, we hiked it. It was just beautiful walking through there. I remember when Stephen was at, 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 uh, at A&M and we were driving through there, just driving down 21, the pine trees just covering the road. Today, we, or, or a few weeks, uh, months ago, we were coming back from, uh, actually September, we were coming through um, from Ohio, and we decided to come down East Texas, take some of the back roads. And she's just like, she's, she's like a little kid just looking out the window because it's so beautiful. She's from South Carolina, and so there's nothing but pine trees out there. You don't see that very much here in Texas unless you go east. And she's just like, it's reminding her of her childhood. And we came through 21, through Bastrop, I mean, I knew what would happen. We went out and ran a race a couple years ago, and we saw some of it. But to come down 21, and those trees aren't covering the road anymore. The pine needles aren't just piling up along the side of 21. All you see is this decimation for as far as your eyes can see. That's painful. But guess what's, going, guess what's happening and what we're going to see in several years? growth. Not only, not only are there going to be pine trees again, but there's going to be more pine trees. That forest is going to become denser than it was before. The, the wildlife that were displaced or destroyed are going to repopulate. And because of the new life and the new growth that's going to come out of that, guess what? There's going to be a larger population of wildlife, people, things to enjoy, things to, to appreciate. Floods, floods destroy. And, they, and, and what people don't understand that when a flood comes through, it picks up all the garbage. And it takes the garbage away. And then once it subsides and everything dries out and life begins to resettle in, it's gorgeous. There's no more trash. You don't see the image of humanity there anymore. Yes, you experience the, 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 the nature's destruction but then you get to see God's dynamic and perpetual life cycle in action. We don't have to create these images to worship them. <laughs> Just go drive two hours any direction and you can find something to admire. Not worship, but admire and to enjoy. And that's the first part of the scripture. God's created all those things. He created with a purpose. He's created for us to enjoy. He's created. But he did not intend for us to copy it so that we can worship it. But that those would be a reflection and a reminder of who he is. Remember I said that God has two very distinct attributes or character traits. His first one is love. And we like to focus on that one. But his second one is judgment. They go hand in hand. You can't have love without judgment and you can't have judgment without love. Jesus is the, the dissecting point, the cross point, the apex of God's love and, just, and justice. The moment was coming where God to pour out his wrath and he was going to judge all mankind. But he didn't just do it flippantly like he did with Noah. No, instead, he sent his son to drink the full cup. Love sent Jesus and love drank the cup of judgment for us. Amen? If that's not enough to worship God, <laughs> if that's not enough to focus on who He is in us, man, we are really depraved. <laughs> we really have issues. And it's no wonder that we cry out sometimes, God, come quickly. It's so easy to want to escape. But for every one of us that escapes, how many more out there don't have the opportunity. Father, we thank you this morning for, <clears throat> for your word and your, and your promises. We thank you, Lord, that Jesus was very intentional and very emphatic when he came about the, 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 how you dealt with the children of Israel and how you want to deal with your church. And throughout history, humanity has struggled with with idolatry in, 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 
in different facets of our lives, Father, whether it's, it's personal, whether it's professional, whether it's spiritual. But the bottom line is, Lord, you've created all of these things for us to admire and to all point back to you. Not so that we can recreate or we can, we can create out of our own mind and thinking something to replace you. So, Lord, I just want to encourage us this week not to be fanatical and go through our houses and take down all the crosses or idols of worship, but to pray and to seek your face and to discover, are there things in our lives that we have put before you? They could be simple. They could be complex. They could be items or things that are inanimate. And they can't even be people. We're just asking, Lord, that you you reveal to us so that we can navigate through, through our relationship with you in purity of heart. And just trust that you're enough. Even when we don't see you, even when we don't feel you, even when we don't sense that you're there, that we still trust that you are enough and that you are not far from us. We thank you this morning. We praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We'll pick up next week on, uh, with the second part of that. Um, hmm? Oh, um, Becky just reminded me it's Mission Sunday. I won't be picking up next week on that. <laughs> so, so you'll have to come back the first Sunday in, uh, in, uh, in June for the second part of it. If you, in case you were going, man, I don't want to be there at Mission Sunday because i got to give more money. You can skip to next week. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> but you are dismissed for a brief moment if you are a... Uh, let me, before we, we dismissed, how many... How many members are in here? If you would just raise your hand. Raise them high so I can. Eight to nine thirty. Okay, we're good. Just want to make sure we had a, a quorum. If we didn't have a quorum, then there wouldn't be any reason to stay. Okay, so. Um, since we do have a quorum in here, um, I want to ask something. John, are we still broadcasting? Oh, you cut it? Yeah, cut it. <clears throat> Since we do have a quorum in here, I want to ask you a question.